So here I have a version of the diagram that I showed you just now. Right? So we have the, the two axes for two measurements of Bob. And uh, we have this probability map with the conditional probabilities marked. These are exactly the data you get in an experiment. So now we have bring in this additional assumption that there is a joint measurement. The joint measurement means that Bob has one device which has two outcomes. Now, if you have one device and uh, if you have two outcomes, that is four possibilities altogether, right? Plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, and so on. So these are probabilities, those are four numbers. Of course, they add up to one, which means that you have a three-dimensional object. So actually, I brought this three-dimensional object here. It's a, it's a tetrahedron. Right? So the four corners depend to these outcomes, like plus plus, uh, the opposite one would be minus minus, and plus minus, and so on. So these are these four. And uh, actually, the way to understand this, this three-dimensional figure is that we have the same axis as before, like Bob B1 and B2. And in the vertical, I've just listed B1 times B2. So that means that only in, in, in each vertical, only one of these possibilities is possible because this is the product of the two, right? So that, but that makes these four points. So this is why they're sort of spread out in the third dimension by looking at what you get as an expectation value for the product of the two signs, right? You have plus minus one outcomes, and their product is another thing that you can that you can read off from a joint measurement. Right, so that, so we have like a, we, before we had only one line that would describe a single measurement, and you have a probability value. Now we get a point in this figure, right? And it's it's a tetrahedron because these are the extremal possibilities that you can have. The the sides of this uh, tetrahedron actually correspond to some inequality that says that certain probabilities have to be positive. Right, I'm not spelling it out in detail, but the extremal situations. Are the corners of this tetrahedron. Now, the way this whole thing is drawn is that we can make a connection with the previous two-dimensional figure. So now, if if Bob doesn't have the joint measurement, but the definition of a joint measurement is that this, you get the same marginals as before. What does that mean in this diagram? So, if there's certain preparation on Alice's side that produces a point somewhere in this tetrahedron, then we can read off from there what the what the expectations for the B1 measurement should be because of this joint measurement condition and for the B2 measurement. That is, the only thing we don't have is the expectation value for the product. That, that we can't see if you have only one measurement, if we, do, if we don't have the joint measurement. So actually going from this probability space for the outcomes of the joint measurement back to the two individual ones is exactly projecting in the vertical, forgetting the product direction, forgetting this direction, right? Okay, so, so we know that these points here actually come from, uh, from the original experiment, right, where you don't have the joint measurement, but now if you have, we know that these must be the projections of some points inside the tetrahedron. And so let's see where they, where they might lie. So we know that the, the conditional preparations that I talked about before, but now looked at with, um, with the joint measurement, they would correspond to some points in this tetrahedron. And, and so, so, so you can see them, these possible points. We, I took out one of the sides, right? So, so this, this side was taken out. And now we, we have wires now marking these lines from top to bottom, which correspond to this projection. So, for example, if you look at this conditional preparation, it has to be a point on this line, on the vertical line, connecting this point and the corresponding one on the diagram below. Right? So we know exactly where this goes. And what you see here is that there is a bit, a bit of red piece here. That is, that is the line on which it can lie, because this is the part that is directly on this line, on this projection line, and it's also inside the tetrahedron. There's a rest of the wire here that you cannot see very well, but that is impossible. That cannot be the proper joint, 
probability that you get because it's outside the tetrahedron. So we have to be inside this, it has to be a possible set of probabilities for the joint measurement. That is the condition that I'm evaluating here. So, so we have this, this red piece here, which corresponds to the possible prob joint probabilities for the, for the joint measurement, corresponding to this condition of preparation. There's one for the opposite one. Here's the opposite, the same setting, but opposite result. That gives one up here, right? Um, I have to learn how to point at this. <laughs> it's there, okay, right there. Okay, so now th these are the, the, you see here very nicely the possible joint, um, the, the, the possible probabilities seen on the joint measurement for a particular setting on Alice's side. And that would be on this red line. Now we know that the unconditional um, prob preparation that, that makes this setting, but does not select according to the results, will be on the line between the two. So somewhere uh, on, this, on the rectangle that you find here between these two red, red lines. Okay? So we'll be somewhere there. Now, of course, there's also the other setting, this setting that we discuss, and uh, you will see that if, if, I hold the, if I hold the tetrahedron right, you see that it's down there in the bottom. It's, it's another rectangle like this. Now for the no signaling condition, right? The no signaling condition in this previous diagram was that these lines meet in the middle. That is, that is what you see on, the, on your various measurements if no selection is made, and that doesn't depend on the setting. There's an intersection, and that is the whole point of no signaling, right? That you cannot distinguish whether which, which of the two, on which of the two lines you are. You are right in the center here. So now if you look at it in this case, we have a nice three-dimensional view here. We have these two rectangles, one coming from this setting, and the other coming from that setting. And they just don't intersect. Look where the red, red, red lines go. There's a wide gap between them, right? This is about this size, right? So, so if Bob now looks just at the expectation value of the product, which is the vertical axis here, he can distinguish which, which measurement that Alice chose. So that is signaling. That is signaling, right? So, so the fact that the, the, the unselected, um, preparations can be distinguished by a measurement on Bob's side. That's exactly how he gets the signal. So just to, to see what happens in an extreme case, right? the kind of conclusion that we get here. This is the state place of quantum mechanics I described. Right? Um, so we, we cannot, quantum mechanics cannot go outside the circle. But hypothetically, we could think of, of a situation where th this goes all the way to the end. Then these these rectangles, these red lines, would shrink to a point. They would, this, this line would shrink, just shrink to the corner. And then this prediction would be a rule that works with certainty. But still, the way the communication now works is when Bob looks at the joint measurement, and he doesn't care about the individual results, he only looks at the product of the two, of the two outcomes. Whenever the product is plus, which is the top line, then, um, then he would guess that Alice chose this setting. When he finds a product minus, he guesses that Alice cho chooses that setting. And you can see from this geometrical figure that, that actually he will be right in many cases, certainly more than 50%, and you can compute the ratio, it's over 70%. Or so. So, so actually, this is, a, this is a noisy channel. When Alice does her settings all the time, and Bob measures this sign, and that is a noisy channel. That is, there will be errors. Right? Sometimes he gets it wrong because it's a probabilistic statement. Uh, he gets it right sufficiently often so that he can actually, like, you send every bit several times and with a little bit of error correction, you can get a perfect message transmission. The theory for that is just Shannon's theory of information. It's clear that you have a positive channel capacity. You can really send signals over to that kind of channel. So we've concluded that if Bob has the joint measurement, he doesn't see this diagram, he sees the 3D diagram, and by just looking at the sign, 
he can actually decide what measurement Alice made, or he can make a good guess at what, what measurement Alice made. 